Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Welcome to the SOLA seminar series. And I hope everyone is doing OK with yesterday's news and can find in their home and um, safe. And hopefully we will overcome the second uh, scare of COVID-19. Today we have a special topic with Dr. Mirko Guralda, a senior lecturer in architecture at the Queensland University of Technology. Uh, Dr. Mirko Guralda is an academic with more than 19 years of experience, and he is internationally recognized for his innovative work in the field of urban design, addressing in particular the novel concept of people-place interaction, inquiring into the complex issues of place, quality, and community engagement. Today, he will talk to us about a very special topic in those uncertain times, which is um, using online platforms for teaching. The title of his uh, seminar is A Gamified Approach to Urban Morphology, Engaging Students with Technology in the Study of Urban Form. Welcome, Mirko, and the stage is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me, Nada. And thank you for your lovely introduction. And I also hope that you are all uh, uh, safe in uh, in New Zealand. I was just telling Nada that we are all looking at New Zealand uh, as um, the canary in the sense that uh, we are really anxious to see what's happening over there because uh, uh, we are all in together in this uh, pandemic and we are really all try to understand how to cope uh, with uh, a situation that ch is changing every day. And uh, as many of us had to face uh, different ways to engage with students, um, not for our own will, but for the contingency of the situation, I thought that uh, might be interesting for you to um, see what I've been doing with uh, my uh, teaching in uh, the last uh, uh, six years. Um, as Nada was saying, I'm senior lecturer at the Queensland University of Technology. I've been there 10 years and prior to that, I was a senior landscape architect in local government um, in Australia and prior to that uh, in Italy, where I come from and where I took my degrees at the Politecnico of, uh, uh, of Milan. And um, what uh, I'd like to do today is to share with you my uh, experience in teaching uh, uh, urban morphology, which is a particular aspect of urban design, and um, is not the focus of the curriculum within which I teach, which is an architecture curriculum, and uh, how I shifted my idea of teaching from uh, a really traditional way to engage students face to face with in class activities to a different paradigm, which is a true online environment. And uh, the second part uh, of uh, the talk, uh, I will show you in detail uh, architecture in the city, which is uh, um, the unit where I've been experimenting more with uh, uh, different technologies, different tools, and different ways to engage uh, uh, students. Um, in the first part of the talk, uh, I will share with you more about theoretical concept. The second part of the talk will be more practical, and uh, I will show you actually the material of the unit. So in this second part, if you've got any questions, feel free to uh, ask the question, and Ada will interrupt me, and I can directly answer to you uh, while we discuss the unit. Um, first of all, I'm pretty sure that you all know what is urban morphology, and here I've got just a couple of definitions. Uh, urban morphology is the study of the city as human habitat, or urban morphology is the study of the physical or built fabric of urban form, and the people and the processes shaping it. When I introduce students to urban morphology, there's always this ambiguity because we uh, define two things with urban morphology. We define the actual form of the city, like the two-dimensional environment of the city and all the processes that influence city making, as well as the discipline, the studies, urban, uh, urban form. And uh, it's often uh, interesting to engage with architecture students who are trained to think in terms of the object uh, and uh, try to uh, teach them to think in terms of uh, uh, systems and the relationship between uh, what is tangible, which is the form of the city, 
with what is intangible, which are all the social and uh, ontological processes that influence uh, uh, our urban, uh, urban environments. That's uh, the curriculum that we are currently delivering at uh, the Queensland University of Technology. So we got a four year Bachelor of Design with a first major in architectural studies and then a one year Master of Architecture. And uh, the unit that I teach uh, is just in the middle of the curriculum. Uh, you can see here in the center at first semester, third year architecture in the city. And that is the only unit uh, fully uh, dedicated to the study of urban environments. So basically, I found myself tasked with uh, the duty of compressing uh, the entire knowledge of urban design in a 12 credit points unit, which means uh, 13 weeks of uh, deliveries for uh, uh, one semester. The unit was first introduced uh, in um, 2008 when this new curriculum started and uh, it was delivered uh, in uh, a quite traditional way. Uh, students had uh, two projects they had to engage with. The first project was in class discussions about readings and the second project was a poster on a chosen topic. In uh, 2010, when I joined QT, I was uh, uh, given this unit and uh, I was asked to redesign it, uh, changing its focus from, uh, the from a more uh, descriptive approach about theories and uh, just understanding theories to something that was more uh, applied. So when we redesigned the, the unit in 2010, uh, the focus moved to apply the knowledge of urban morphology more than just uh, understanding different uh, theories about uh, cities. And so what we asked students was to engage still with two projects. And one of these projects was to investigate a city producing an in-depth in uh, investigations on this urban environment and also doing a physical model of this city. From 2013, I started shifting the uh, way to deliver the unit uh, for different reasons. And uh, I started uh, testing how to transition the unit uh, uh, online. Uh, this was to try to engage students in a different way because something that the unit has been suffering was that uh, students were not attending tutorials anyway and so basically there was this disengagement because they had other commitments and so they could not really find the time to engage with the unit. So in 2013 I first uh, delivered the unit in uh, a blended mode and students could opt if they wanted to join a face-to-face -face tutorial or uh, an online tutorial. And in terms of the online tutorial, uh, I tested different options. Uh, there was video conferencing, like what we are doing now, and also an asynchronous mode through discussion board. And uh, there were also changes in uh, the requirements to deliver the project. And so we moved from uh, the actual physical model to a model um, delivered using uh, augmented reality, which is what you see here. Uh, the student is actually seeing that model through her phone. And then uh, in 2019, the unit went uh, fully online. So till uh, 2018, uh, uh, we still had uh, some face-to-face -face components, like some uh, uh, workshops to uh, work together on specific uh, skills to develop within the units and students were still requested to attend uh, an event where to present their work. And till 2018, I still actually used to give face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, uh, lectures. Uh, 2019, uh, we went uh, fully online, so students uh, don't have to physically be at uni to attend the unit and uh, they can clearly approach the unit in a completely uh, different way due to the online environment. In terms of the different components that I use in designing the unit, in terms of pedagogy, the first component is the constructivist pedagogy. So is the idea of uh, building the student's experience on their knowledge and then expand this knowledge. And when this new knowledge is consolidated, to repeat the operation, building again on their knowledge. 
Um, so it's an iterative process requesting students to start from what they know and then expand their knowledge and then use this new knowledge to do something. On the top of this, uh, I also, I'm also influenced by the transformative pedagogy, uh, which means that uh, in terms of my personal ethical stance, uh, uh, and because this is the only unit where students uh, work on urban system, what I'm interested in is also in uh, fostering a change in the students' attitude towards uh, uh, cities. And, and so that's why the transformative pedagogy. My aim is that at the end of the unit, students will have learned new skills and new knowledge to prepare them as uh, reflective practitioners. And uh, I would like also them to understand uh, that architecture is more than an actual uh, building. So our students are really good in uh, thinking of the building itself, while what I'm trying to do is to broaden their horizons and understand that the building is part of a border system, of a border ecology. And so uh, when they design something, also to think about is the context around it. Um, once I moved the unit online, I realized that actually the online environment uh, gives uh, different opportunities. And uh, another opportunity that I started experimenting was the concept of uh, uh, gamification. Um, gamification is really used today in different, uh, in different ways um, as an engagement tool. Uh, the most evident aspect of gamification are uh, points and point systems. Uh, which we deal with uh, every day. Uh, you gain points doing everything. When we could, uh, we were able to travel, you know, you gain points as frequent flyers. So that's a way to reward you for a behavior and uh, keep you engaged with that uh, behavior. Uh, gamification is more than this, is also a tactic where you can put uh, students uh, at the center of the learning experience and really uh, allow them to customize their experience. So something that uh, I learned in delivery of this unit was that uh, uh, students uh, were asking for uh, a way to engage uh, with the knowledge that was presented to them uh, in different ways, in the sense that uh, the activities that I designed uh, were really engaging for some students, why other students were really struggling. And when I started offering uh, alternatives for the second project of the unit, uh, which was an in-depth analysis of one element of their city, uh, I was surprised because some students asked me, can I do more than one option? Uh, so there was this uh, since the students wanted to have more agency on their learning. And so I started researching gamification and uh, how more agency could be given to uh, the students in terms of uh, shaping their own learning experience. And uh, the online environment uh, is really well suited for this type of uh, experimentations because uh, once uh, you are not bounded from uh, a timetable and a schedule, uh, you realize that you can really uh, explore different things uh, and you can really be creative with your own uh, teaching. In the sense that uh, once I moved the unit online, I realized that uh, you can actually ask students to work in different uh, ways. You're not bounded to those uh, two, three hours of face-to-face -face interaction that you have and you can uh, create the interaction in a much more fluid way. And the main learning uh, I had from engaging with online environment is that uh, um, one common mistake is try to replicate online what you do in the classroom. What instead is really useful to understand the potential of the online tools and how you can use them to better engage with the students and to better achieve what uh, you want, uh, which is a deep learning and a transformative experience for the student. So these are some of the slides that I show to the students. This is the traditional way we teach uh, at QT where we got large classes. I generally have in this class between uh, 130 to 160 students. So there are a lot of students in the class. And so the general approach is that uh, there's the unit coordinator who coordinates and delivers the lecture. 
And then you've got uh, tutors that uh, work with students in uh, parallel uh, tutorials. And so the unique coordinator, who often is the expert on the subject, uh, is often removed uh, from uh, the uh, students. And students working with different tutors would have uh, a slightly different experience because each tutor is an expert in his own right, in their own right in one specific, uh, uh, is one specific area and one specific topic. So there's this really hierarchical way to see uh, teaching and uh, there are all these different filters between the students and the unit coordinator and the tutors. And they often the tutors have just to deliver what the unit coordinator has uh, uh, planned and organized. The model that uh, I adopt instead is more collaborative so you see that learning is at the center and then around the learning experience, you've got uh, at the same level, students, tutors and the union coordinator. Everybody is contributing something and everybody is uh, uh, working towards the same aim, which is this transformative learning experience to gain a better understanding of how our city work. And uh, the online environment and the gamification process also allows me to give more agency to tutors because uh, uh, some of my tutors actually deliver smaller projects within uh, the unit on which they have uh, full control, uh, which has been really beneficial also for those tutors who wanted to start an academic career because uh, they could prove uh, in their portfolio that they were able to design an exercise and fully deliver it. Um, so the gamification works really well to engage the students, was also really well to empower the tutors and give them more uh, recognition of their experience. In terms of the actual unit, architecture in the city, um, the unit is structured in three streams. So there are the activities, uh, what the students are actually are doing. One of the pillars of the constructivist uh, pedagogy is that it's not so important what the lecturer does, it's more important what the students do. So the starting point in designing the unit is uh, a suite of different activities that students can engage with. Then there are the contents that uh, since 2019 are 100% uh, delivered online and students can uh, jump from the activities to the contents as they need in the sense that uh, uh, they can take all the contents in a sequence or they can engage with activities and then on demand looking at the contents. And then there are also resources which are more practical uh, tools that students uh, might have to use to fulfill the activities that they are requested to engage. Um, I will show in a minute uh, the actual website of the unit where you see this is the menu of the different activities that the students uh, uh, can engage with uh, and uh, the activities are divided uh, in uh, four uh, steps. So we got uh, basic uh, activities um, in the unit I call them quests to keep in line with the uh, gamified approach and uh, those are activities that uh, students can engage at the beginning of the semester. We got self-assessment tests, a theory bank where they basically have to do uh, annotated bibliography. We got an urban forum where students discuss a topic. And also we got coaching session where students um, have a 20 minute session with me where they discuss about their ideas about the unit and their, idea, their ideas about their learning. So those are really quick preliminary uh, activities the students can do to start engaging with basic concept. Then they can move to intermediate quest where they start applying this concept to a real concrete uh, environment. And so we got the design challenge where students are asked to critique uh, some uh, real projects. The city exhibition which substantially is the same uh, project that we designed 10 years ago about an in-depth investigation of an urban environment. And then students can also design their own uh, quest. Then we have advanced quests, which are more uh, structured and that require students to have uh, a higher level of critical thinking. Uh, there's the Logan City Studio, which is uh, an activity that we deliver with Logan City Council, which is a local government here in Queensland. And the major quests are actually the quest designed by the tutors. So um, I've got uh, 
this year I had three head tutors, last year I had four. Uh, each of them design their own quest and they were really happy because they could really align this activity with, this their, own, uh, with their own interest. And then Fantastic City is uh, a more creative way to engage uh, with the content of the units where uh, students have to design um, an ideal city using the concept of the unit. And then we got the final quests, which are uh, a general reflection on the learning and uh, extempore, which is an examination, which are to close the semester and consolidate their learning. Students gain uh, points in the different quests, and then they can translate these points at the end of the semester in, uh, in a score. At QT, we use a seventh, uh, seven level point system from low fail, which is a one, to high distinction, which is a seven. And here you see the different threshold from going from one level to another level. Uh, the way the unity structure is that uh, students don't have to commit uh, to just two activities as it happens in a traditional unit. Uh, students have got a menu of different quests and they can decide how many they want to engage with and how they want to organize their uh, semester. There are some students that prefer to take the unit in a block delivery mode and so finish the unit by the mid semester and then use the rest of the semester to do other things. Other students prefer to uh, spread out the engagement with the unit on the entire semester and other students prefer to focus on the unit towards the end of the semester after they finish with other uh, commitments. Uh, the format of the quest and the point system um, is particularly um, engaging for the students because they can monitor at any point of the semester where they arrive. In the sense that uh, once they engage with a quest, uh, they get feedback uh, within one week. And so they always know how many points they have and how they are working towards their target. And what happens is that as soon as they hit their target, the students know that they don't need to engage anymore with, uh, with the unit. And also they can really target their uh, uh, engagement because clearly some students want really to do well and so they go for 3,000 points. Uh, other students they just want to pass the unit and so they just aim for their 1,500, uh, 1500 points. Um, the other things about uh, the point system is that uh, allows students to be more uh, experimental because there's not this anxiety on having to commit uh, to just one activity and to have to do that committee really, that activity really, really well. Uh, something that I found uh, in delivering this unit is that students were too concerned about their performance in the actual work than what they were actually learning. And so several students were constraining themselves uh, because they didn't want to take risk. This format allows students to take risks and to be more experimental with their learning because they know that till the very end of the semester they still got the, the caps. And some students really appreciate this because uh, uh, they experiment with different things and uh, they don't have the anxiety of failure because they say, okay, I didn't get many points with this quest, that's okay, I will do better in the next, uh, uh, in the next quest. And interestingly, since I introduced this system, uh, I saw a drastic drop in students asking me to remark their work or students complaining about their uh, uh, assessment. They didn't get what they were expecting uh, because that anxiety of failure has been removed. Uh, now the question that I got is, uh, oh, I didn't really do well in this quest. Can you suggest me another quest that I can do where I can make up for the point that I didn't have? So once the students understand uh, the mechanics, uh, uh, it's really interesting to see how they really buy into it uh, and they really engage uh, with the different activities and there's not this uh, anxiety of uh, uh, always performing at the top and they are much more relaxed uh, in uh, experimenting with their learning and actually enjoying more with their learning experience. I'll show you the actual website of the unit. Um, now if you can tell me if you can see this website, if you can just give me a thumbs up. Yes. Yes. OK. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, uh, how the main interface that I use to communicate with the student is organized. 
Um, I've got uh, the three dashboard, the quest dashboard, which is about the activities, the module dashboard, which is about the content, and the resource dashboard, which is about uh, the uh, resources. Here you see those are the different uh, quests that the students can take. There's a little blurb explaining uh, what it is. An indication of the time that the quest uh, is requiring and how many points uh, they will get for the task and when they can take the task. Uh, this was actually one of my learnings because uh, when I first, first introduced the point system, I linked the point uh, mainly to the depth of the activity that I was asking students to do, while the feedback that they gave me was that uh, for them was clearer to link uh, the points to the time uh, they requested on the unit because uh, they thought if I spend a lot of time on a quest, I should get more points than a quest in half half an hour. So something interesting is always uh, thinking how the student uh, interpret what, what we are doing, because I was looking more on awarding points on the quality of the activity they were doing, while students think more in terms of the quantity of what they're doing. And so what I say here is not only the time of doing the actual activity, is also the time that I think they should spend in researching and uh, studying for that uh, uh, for the task and so I can put together my approach which is about uh, the quality of what they do with the way the students think in terms of the quantity so one week activity is 240 points and then all the other activities are on a um, relationship with this base then if we get uh, inside uh, one of the quests uh, they all got the same format oh this is not good just give me one second. I prepared everything earlier and it went in, it went in all. Okay. So that's how a natural quest works like. Uh, there's a, a summary where uh, I say how much requires them, how many points, when it starts, when is the submission, what is the output? Uh, interestingly, that's the first thing that students always ask me is what I have to do. So that's why first I put the output and then what is the rationale for the quest? Uh, then there's the general uh, uh, background of what uh, uh, students have uh, to do and how the quest is organized. Then uh, what actually I'm expecting them to do, the assessment requirements. Uh, so I give them bullet points of what they have to include in their work. And then the assessment, here you see that's the uh, marking rubrics of the different criteria that they have to consider when they are performing and the different level that they can achieve. So students don't get points just for doing an activity. Uh, each activity is still marked and assessed. Then you've got uh, the submission section and then I always got a tip and tips and tricks sections where I suggest how to approach uh, the uh, quest and I also give links to the modules that they should review uh, to assess this, uh, um, this work. This is a fairly simple quest. If we go to one which is more advanced, like the city exhibition, when I explain how they should uh, do the assessment, clearly this much more uh, uh, detail because this task is more complex and students have to uh, deliver a series of different uh, uh, items for this quest. And you see that uh, there are several hyperlinks uh, so that uh, once a student decides to engage with a quest, they found everything that they need there. This is also something that I learned uh, while delivering this unit is that uh, one of the feedback the students were keep giving me was, oh, I really would like everything to be in one spot, which uh, in my mind it was. Uh, then it took me a while to understand what students meant in the sense that uh, they want to understand what they have to do. And then when they decide which quest they want to do, they want everything in the same spot. And so using the hyperlink is a way to bring together everything and students know that looking at this document and all the links, they don't miss anything that they need for the, uh, for the quest. 
Um, and also in the tippet tricks here, you see that is a longer exercise is much more structured. And also here you've got all the different links. And uh, we also provide example. And here is just to give you a snapshot of uh, how many cities we've done. Uh, I think that we are up to 700 cities um, all over the world. And uh, you see the different uh, um, version of the unit. So the blue is the first version, which was still the traditional one, students doing posters. And then you've got uh, the purple and the yellow, which are uh, the digital one. And the one with uh, the camera is the new version where students uh, uh, also are asked to do uh, um, a video of the digital model. So they don't have to do any more a physical model or a virtual model. They do a digital model and then they've got uh, a fly through. The way we engage with the students is uh, through an asynchronous blog. So basically, uh, that's the student posting uh, their material. There's a link uh, to their work and there are their question and uh, how they are approaching the topic. And here you see you've got uh, the tutors uh, providing, uh, providing feedback. Um, something that uh, the online delivery has really changed is the relationship between uh, the tutors and the students in the sense that in a traditional model, a student will just speak with one person because tutors don't have the time to speak uh, with multiple students, especially when you got large classes. Um, what's evident in the online model is that actually tutors are more strategic in their time. And so when a student post uh, is actually quite uh, engaging for the students, uh, for the tutors, providing feedback to the students. And, and you see that uh, um, multiple tutors provide feedback to the same students. Uh, that's because uh, um, when you are in the flow or looking at the material, it's really easy to just provide the feedback instead of thinking of the students as already had feedback. Um, becomes much more collaborative and uh, different tutors then uh, become an expert of one aspect and they provide feedback mainly on those uh, uh, on those aspects. Something that is really important and uh, Linda, which is one of my head tutors, is really good at is uh, in being proactive. So she always posts uh, um, reminders for the students uh, and uh, she's always really encouraging. It is, the thing about the online environment is that you have to give a signal that you are there, that you are present, because students don't see you. And so sending out this kind of messages and reminders is always good to remind students about uh, what they are meant to be doing and uh, to engage with uh, the actual uh, activity in the online studio. What uh, we've been doing this year is that uh, in addition to um, the online journals, uh, this year I brought back uh, a synchronous uh, session. Um, so we had uh, two drop-in session on Tuesday afternoon and Thursday afternoon, and students can just uh, uh, log in online and speak uh, with one of the tutors about uh, their work. So if some students didn't feel comfortable in posting the stuff in the journal, they can always join the video conference and discuss it uh, um, online instead of posting and, uh, and typing. And, and also this has worked quite, um, quite well in the sense that uh, this cater for different students uh, having uh, different ways to relations to the, uh, to the unit. Um, what is quite uh, interesting of this approach is uh, that students don't feel that they have to commit to an activity and they can really choose the activities that they resonates more with uh, uh, with them. Then clearly you have to be really diligent in providing timely feedback to the students because this is part of the game in the sense that uh, this approach works as long as students get their feedback uh, really quickly and uh, they know how many points they got really quickly. So it's really important that when uh, you design the rubrics, uh, the rubrics are really easy to uh, engage with uh, and uh, you really know what to look for when you do the assessment so that you can be really time efficient in the delivery of your feedback.
So that's a component about uh, engaging the students in terms of their work. In terms of the, let me open this again from here just in case. In terms of the delivery of the contents, there's uh, this other interface, which is the module dashboard. Um, here I've got 14 modules, uh, which is also another advantage of the online teaching. In face-to-face, -face, I have to commit to a 13 weeks uh, uh, semester, in the sense that typically we would have uh, 13 weeks, and we all know that the first lecture and the last lecture generally are lost uh, for uh, uh, organizational issues. When you organize your unit in an online environment, uh, you can have as many modules as you uh, as you want. So here I've got 14 uh, because I didn't have to commit uh, to a schedule in the calendar. I could actually choose which topics I wanted to give to the students. So I've got uh, the two in basic uh, uh, introductory modules, which are the morphology of the city and the ontology of the city, where we start discussing uh, the basic. So the physical tangible component of the cities and the more intangible um, social, political and economical components of the city. And uh, for these two modules, I still got uh, a webinar and it's really interesting to see how students get into it really uh, quickly uh, in the sense that I always end up with much more questions than um, with face-to-face -face lectures because uh, I discovered that students uh, feel quite confident in typing a questions instead of asking the question in the uh, open lecture. Then these other five modules are about uh, tools and application of tools. So basically I unpack these two concepts in a series of subtopics and to see how the form of the city can be investigated from different point of views and how we can read uh, the ontology. So the social political tenants that form our cities from different components of our cities. The other modules on this other side in light blue, those are instead what I call the critique modules. Those are more advanced uh, topics uh, where uh, instead of offering tools to students, I offer uh, uh, provocations. So those are in-depth uh, um, discussion of some particular aspects of our cities. And the names of the modules are actually taken from Italo Scalvino's Invisible Cities, and uh, it's just a playful way to engage students with different topics. For example, Continuous Cities is about uh, sustainability and how we engage with cities in the, uh, in the future. In terms of how the modules are organized, I've got an overview. Uh, which explain why they should read the module and what is in the module. Then I've got uh, a short video of uh, myself actually speaking. Uh, I'm not going to play the video. Uh, you can find them on Vimeo anyway. And uh, the videos are something that I've been doing uh, over the course of years. And it's basically me in context uh, speaking. Uh, so when I travel, I always take uh, clips and then, then I put the clips uh, uh, together. And so uh, this one is on the elements of the city. When I'm speaking about squares, I'm in Siena. When I'm speaking about streets, I'm in Milan. Or uh, when I speak about uh, parks, I might be in uh, uh, South America. So this is also a way to show the students what I'm speaking of while I'm in uh, uh, in there. And the important thing is that those videos are really short, are like nine, ten minutes, because they give in a condensed way what the students should uh, focus on in this module. And then uh, there's another section which uh, is the one where uh, I go more in detail on the concept that I touch it into the video. And also here with really uh, a quite uh, concise text, uh, I explain how they apply that knowledge. So those are actually works done by students in the past on a specific city and I showed them what is the knowledge, some examples, and then how they apply the knowledge in structuring an urban analysis. So those are all examples. And at the end, 
there are different ways where they can use that knowledge to inform their practice as uh, reflective uh, architects and urban designers. So this is something that uh, I found uh, difficult to compress uh, in a face-to-face -face lecture and instead works really well in the online environment because uh, uh, students can really pace themselves uh, in going to the content and then there's the theory and then there's also the application of that theory in the specific context of something that they are requested to be doing. And also here there are all the links uh, to the work that other students have done so they can see the element that they're showing them in the context of this module and then they can check out the actual work that the students have done at a broader scale. Then there's a bibliography and also in terms of the bibliography you see that there are all links so the students don't have to look for the readings, uh, the readings are all uh, connected and uh, I generally try to also give them some of the things that I've read so that they understand that when I'm speaking about something that's because I'm an expert on the topic. Um, there's also something interesting that I found is that often students don't see us as expert they see us as teachers, that they are training them on something. While I found uh, that they appreciate more when uh, they see that when we speak about something is because we've done research on it and we've done uh, actually publication on it. And, and what I found is that sometimes students come back to me asking me if I publish anything about this or that because they need it for other, for other unit. Then there are a series of uh, uh, media that uh, I provide the students in terms of enriching their experience. And if you do your homework and look at what's available out there, uh, you will find out that there's actually quite uh, good, uh, uh, good quality of videos even uh, on Vimeo on YouTube done by amateurs that uh, are quite effective in communicating uh, some of the concept uh, that uh, we want to teach our students. Then I finish with a thought of the day, which is another uh, uh, video, generally is a tech talk, where uh, I try to give uh, a different perspective to the students and also in this case is a short video and this can help students to understand better what they have to take away from the module. And then at the end, uh, I always give three bullet points. I give myself as a rule to not give more than three of the three basic things that they should take away from each uh, module. So this makes uh, the module really manageable for the students. And uh, because all the modules are there uh, since uh, uh, day one of the unit, uh, uh, students can pace themselves going through them. Some students like to do one module every week. Some students do them in a block. And it's really interesting to see that the ones that do in a block, then uh, from week two, they are really able to start playing with uh, the different materials that uh, we are giving them. The last section is the resource section, which is more about uh, uh, skills and training about specific skills. For example, in uh, drafting cities, you see a series of uh, uh, short uh, contents that are developed to train students uh, to do a specific type of drawing. For example, this one is how to draw a figure ground map. And uh, when you go through, you've got a little bit of the theory and where, what you need, where do you find your information. And then there is step by step how you do the map. So you have to select the building and then you have to design the footprints and then the kind of things that you can that you can add. And I have to say that uh, I used to do this kind of training face to face and was not really effective. Since I started using those videos, the quality of the drawing of the student has really improved because students uh, don't have to rely on something that are the notes that they took during the workshop. They can always go back here, see the training and understand uh, how to do a specific map. And uh, in some of the modules, um, actually also got uh, some of this training on how to do an historical analysis or how to do a mobility analysis and they are embedded in some of the learning uh, of the learning modules. Um, 
so that was in a nutshell uh, how the unit has been crafted. Um, the main thing is to think of the student-centered approach. As I said, one of the constructivist pedagogy principle is to think of what students are doing, and it's more important to think of what students are doing than what we are doing as teachers. And uh, in developing this unit, what I tried was really to give uh, agency and control to students so they can pace themselves, they can choose the different activities that they like to engage, and they can really customize uh, their learning experience to suit uh, their uh, uh, personal interest. Uh, the other thing is to align my teaching and my research. As I said, uh, once students understand that I'm actually an expert on what I'm teaching them, uh, they understand that I speak uh, with an authoritative voice and uh, they understand that uh, behind what I teach them, there's actually a quite substantial body of research. And also students feel uh, that uh, they are part of a bigger process when uh, um, you engage them also in sharing with your research. Um, something always to remember with online teaching is to be proactive and be present in the sense that uh, um, students might have the idea that because the unit is online, they are alone. So it's really important to send out uh, emails to the class asking students how they are traveling, uh, being available to uh, catch up uh, with students with quick uh, um, sessions where they might have to clarify things. And I always end my email. If you need anything, please let me know. I'm always happy to eventually meet to discuss the unit with you. And you have to be really proactive and remind the students uh, when the deadline are approaching and uh, when a new quest is opening so the students feel that they are not left alone and uh, you are there for uh, them. Um, clearly, I didn't get uh, at this level in uh, one year. Uh, what you see here is uh, seven years of uh, work uh, where uh, every year I've been adding uh, uh, bits and pieces and changing bits and pieces. When I started with the gamification process, I actually kept the structure of the website similar to pre-gamification and I found out that that was a mistake in the sense that that's when I had to start thinking how our students would approach the unit and not how I approach the unit. Because that was the, the biggest job that I've done last year was to redesign the Blackboard uh, website, uh, so to have these uh, three uh, sections, three dashboards. Um, the content were already present in different ways, so the biggest work was to redesign the interface, not so much working on the content. So you need to understand where you want to arrive and then have a plan how to do it so that you don't invest too much uh, every year on one element. The other thing is that uh, this approach allows you to make uh, changes uh, because uh, every year I can see how students are traveling in the unit, how they are performing in the different quests. And uh, if I see that something is not coming through clearly, I can always add a new activities or suggest uh, a new um, type of engagement uh, to correct the learning experience of the students. The main thing is to dedicate time to the students more than to contents delivery. Um, when I start teaching, um, I used to give really long lectures because I saw that I had to give a lot of content to the students. Um, when I was teaching in Italy, we used to have three hour lectures. Uh, when I started QT, I still used to have two hour lectures. And now I don't dedicate time to lectures because all the content are online. I dedicate my time in working with uh, the uh, with the students. I dedicate time in uh, providing feedback on their work and engaging with them in the learning experience. So um, instead of being removed from the unit and being uh, the person who delivers the contents and administer and manage the unit, um, this format allows me to be more hands on and actually do what I enjoy doing more, which is working with the students and see them going and um, becoming uh, better designers. Um, well, that was for me. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mirko. That's a very interesting presentation. You are giving us a lot to think about. Um, 
uh, I will I will ask my questions later. We have one okay. from Jill. Okay. Uh, really, really inspiring presentation. Thanks, Mirko. Can you explain more about how you developed the resources? What were the barriers, example, time and enablers, um, IT capabilities for AR? So mm -hmm. if you can elaborate a little bit on all of these. Yeah, yeah OK. So when uh, you start planning to put your movie unit online, uh, is start it's really important to start understanding what you want uh, to give the students and what resources you want to give them. Um, the videos are something that uh, I've been developing uh, since 2014. Um, actually, when we start doing the first lot of videos, Jill also did uh, some videos for her unit when she was at QT. And, and that's something that then you keep building. So the first year I had uh, uh, three videos. Uh, and now I got seven, eight videos. And so it's, it's something that uh, you do in an incremental uh, way. In terms of uh, the um, con contents to train students to do an activity, um, for that component, uh, um, I had a research assistant doing all the graphics for me, and then I packaged the graphics. Uh, the thing with that is that when I decide to do that, uh, I had to have all of them done at once uh, uh, because uh, there's not uh, incremental approach for that. In the sense that if you decide that uh, that component is thought online, you need to have a plan of what you need uh, and how you translate it. I already had uh, the face-to-face -face workshop on how to do the activities. So basically I had somebody delivering for me the graphics and then I translated the content of the workshop in a series of videos. So out of one workshop, I got like nine different uh, videos to instruct students how to do bits and pieces. Uh, the other thing uh, that is a little bit time consuming and that pays in the long term is to spend time to really see what is out there uh, in the sense that uh, I found some really good videos about uh, perspective and how to do urban perspective or how to do a different type of uh, uh, models. And so instead of me having to produce this kind of content, uh, you can just link to external contents. And there has to be a balance between what is yours and what is not yours because you don't want to give uh, students the idea that you are outsourcing too much. Um, but surely when I got started, I had uh, support uh, from the faculty who gave me a filming crew for two days plus one day of training. Then once I got my hold on how to do the videos, I started doing my own uh, videos. So when I travel, I've got my tripod, my camera and my mic, and, and I got my way to do the uh, to do the videos. Uh, all the other contents is something that uh, I started developing uh, on my own. Um, I have to say that uh, I spoke a couple of times with the learning designers uh, um, at QT. Uh, which are great and uh, they are really resourceful. The thing is that they are not expert on the topic. Uh, I know the topic and I know what I want to come to, to the topic. So while they can suggest some tools, uh, they cannot really do the work uh, for you. you. You have to understand which kind of activities would be more effective for students to learn what you want to teach them. And so that is something that also requires some time and is a trial and error process in the sense that sometimes you think that an activity will be really successful and students understand that in a completely different uh, different way. I think uh, that the main resource that you have to do when you approach uh, this type of uh, design for your unit is uh, you really need to have clear what you want to achieve uh, and you really need to understand that uh, you might invest a lot of time uh, to produce the contents uh, the thing is what you are gaining in the long terms, in the sense that uh, when I produce my videos, uh, I try to make them uh, really general. So I speak of uh, consolidated knowledge, which is something that I can reuse in time. I try to not remake all the videos every year because uh, that would be really time consuming. So you are making an investment uh, that uh, will give its fruit in the long uh, uh, in the longer term. And I have to say that uh, in terms of my engagement in the unit, now that the unit is online, uh, my engagement in terms of time uh, is the same 
in the sense that uh, I used to spend a lot of time delivering the lectures, preparing the lectures, and uh, doing the administration of the unit, while now I spend the same amount of time working with the students. So I see this uh, much more effective also in terms of the learning experience of the students. Excellent. Thank you very much. So you said something very interesting, which I think you um, you immediately make the difference between face-to-face uh, -face teaching and online teaching is that they are not the same. And the way you have designed your unit or your lectures or the way you're giving this course is um, is is not the same as you would give a, a two hour lecture or a three hour lecture. What I really appreciate is how you have rendered, um, you know, we, we come from a profession where we do a lot of face to face. We do one-on-one mm -hmm. uh, -on -one feedback sessions. There's, there's a lot of uh, uh, relationship building between us and the student in mm -hmm. real life mm -hmm. and taking that to the online platform is extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. It seems that you have come up with a very efficient way to turn your lectures into uh, into uh, an electronic or mm -hmm. videotapes or um, short, you know, text. But, you know, um, it seems like it is something that um, is extremely time consuming. Mm -hmm. So we also are challenged as 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 lectures and as teachers and researchers to always present up to date information. Mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. you in terms of time management so that you can keep that balance between uh, how much time you're giving for preparation and how much mm -hmm. time you're doing for feedback sessions. Uh, how often do you um, uh, so you, you did say that you don't record your your lectures every yeah. so often, but, but do you have a framework for which you're like, OK, maybe every three years or um, Every year I will update one or two videos so that they're yes. they're always updating every year, but in yes. bits and pieces. So as I said, uh, in uh, in the videos, I try to speak about something that is really general. So it's consolidated knowledge so that I don't need uh, to keep updating the videos. It's, it's things that are, uh, uh, you know, basic knowledge that we need to know. The way that uh, I uh, update the content, as you were saying, is that uh, that's the part that I outsource. So at the beginning of uh, the semester, I review the website also because some of the content that are linked might not be there, link might be broken. So that's where I link uh, new videos of something that might be more uh, more topic or if um, that here I want to give uh, a particular flavor, I would change uh, the readings and I would change uh, some of the external resources that I use for the students. So basically I compress uh, my preparation in that uh, um, I wouldn't say that it's a full week uh, uh, because it becomes really time efficient because uh, the unit is already there. You already have to go in some spot and you say, OK, this video doesn't work for what I want to do this year. I look for a different video and change that. In the sense that uh, what uh, was really interesting uh, is when I moved the unit fully online, I was expecting students commenting on the fact that there were no lectures. Nobody commented about that. So the, the fact of delivering the content, I think, is more our uh, uh, idea as educator that we have to deliver the content and show that we know the content. While from the point of the students, uh, uh, they just want to know where is the content. Um, so the, the fact that there were not any more lectures and everything was online uh, out of last year, I had a big call because I had 160 students out of 160 students, not one person commented on the fact that there were not lectures. They, they, oh. they, all, they all were really happy with the contents. They were commenting on the activities. Wow. Um, one more question from Jill. Mm -hmm. So do you think this approach is applicable to multiple design courses? Uh, I, I think it is. I mean, uh, they, I found that the gamification worked really well for this unit because I had to cover a lot of grounds in just one unit. In the sense that this is the only urban design unit that I got in the curriculum uh, of architecture. So I had uh, so many things to compress uh, that I had to find a way to unpack so much. And so I would I would suggest the gamification when you got uh, a unit that allows you to explore uh, different uh, different things. In terms of uh, the the online teaching and the format to engage students with an online platform, um, last semester I actually had to move my uh, studio online. Uh, 
which for me was really uh, painless because uh, I'm quite confident in online environment and uh, my studio is after in the curriculum this unit. So students already knew that I could move the unit online and they knew that uh, they would get something that was working. Um, also in that case, I found uh, um, interesting that uh, when we moved the studio online, uh, students were engaged in a different way in the sense that, uh, as I was telling Nada just before uh, we started, when we were in face-to-face -face, uh, environment, uh, uh, students didn't listen one to each other, while in the online environment, because we are having uh, uh, the discussion in this chat room and students have to listen uh, to them say, I want to go next, uh, they were actually listening to the feedback that I was giving to other students and the process became uh, really uh, efficient in the sense that I didn't have to repeat things and students were anticipating my question. And the students were telling me, oh, I know that this doesn't work because you just told this to the next, to the previous students. Um, I just need to have this different approach. The other things that I noticed is that uh, clearly we all got students who leave uh, uh, the assessment till the last moment. The fact that uh, feedback to other students are recorded in the online journal serves well also the students because uh, often what happens is that students might not have been engaging for the entire semester. And so what they do is that they start going through the discussion board and to see the feedback that they've been given to other students and they can understand uh, what are the common mistakes, uh, how they should uh, develop uh, their own work. And so even if a student doesn't have the time to engage every week, uh, they still uh, there's still this, this backup where they can go back uh, and uh, uh, find the feedback. So I think uh, that uh, uh, the gamification can work well uh, where uh, the content of the unit allows you to uh, break it down in different small activities. Uh, surely the online environment works well for a variety of courses, even for the studio, which is something that probably the majority of people are more hesitant in moving uh, online. As I said at the beginning, the main thing is to not trying to do online the same things that you do face to face. You have to think what is the protocol that you're following online. And I have to say that uh, the feedback that uh, I give uh, in an online chat room uh, are much more direct than the ones that I give uh, in, uh, uh, in a face to face uh, session because, uh, you know, you try to sandwich your feedback, something that is good at the beginning and the end and in the middle what has to be addressed. When you do online, you have to be much more precise because you cannot uh, go back and explain better what you mean. So I found that uh, even the feedback are much clearer and I found the students respond much better to direct clear feedback uh, uh, than uh, the discursive feedback they often we got face to face. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we are um, uh, we just it's a few minutes after two so um since there are no questions i'm gonna say thank you very much mirko and thank you for all of you who attended uh, i'm just gonna close the uh live um live call and um uh, i'll see you guys again next week uh, thank you for having me okay